I'm very pleased to be here to speak on behalf of Unison because um, not just because we are the main union for the support professional staff in schools, the staff who are teachers and head teachers, but also because as a large union with 1.4 million members, most of our members are parents, they're grandparents, they've got family members who go to school, and we have a very um, serious interest in what happens to education in this country on behalf of our members as citizens of this country, not just as people who provide services. There's now a very significant body of evidence that's been built up around the impact of academies, and sadly, of course, the government started down this road and is, seems committed to expanding this programme, either without reading any of the evidence or looking at the evidence or just completely ignoring it. Last year, the TUC commissioned a report from um, the Children's Services Network which was supposed to, which was actually looking at pulling together and analysing all the available evidence there is in uh, around academies. Now this was no mean feat in itself because what it did expose was that academies are a bit like England's secret garden. They're, um, they're exempt from the Freedom of Information Act. They're not bound by many of the reporting requirements that apply to large numbers of other schools. And the CSN who, who wrote this report had to dig very deep to uncover the facts and figures as opposed to the rhetoric around academies. Uh, now, Francis already talked about the sort of historical rationale as to why academies were set up. And, you know, it, it's hard to fault a, a, a rationale that's supposedly based on putting additional resources, um, money and expertise into run-down inner city areas, which was apparently the original aim of the City Academy programme, at least that's what we were told. But the rationale has faltered and quickly faltered because it's obviously apparent that just changing the structure of a school or the governance of a school in itself cannot have an impact on outcomes or improve standards for pupils. It was obviously, um, this was obvious to us from the start that this was the case. When we actually benchmark the record of academies against other interventions, like things like um, excellence in the cities, it's been proved that other, there's lots of other options to actually deliver extra support in the classroom, get improvements in outcomes at far less cost and programmes which are much more likely to be integrated into the local community and into the local authority family of schools. In our view, there's an inherent contradiction in the government's policy, which was about, is about devolving more and more power to individual schools, developing this family of so-called independent state schools, and yet at the same time trying to deliver a series of initiatives across England aimed at, apparently, uh, improving standards, closing the achievement gap for the most disadvantaged pupils. And if the government is really serious about expanding the Academies programme, which although it has changed in direction, as Francis has said, um, these do seem to be serious about this. They cannot be left out of the equation in how they're going to deliver some of these key national strategies, such as you know, the extended services, every child matters, and the national skills agenda. Yet it's clear from the evidence that's around that Academies, by their very nature, are far less likely to be involved in community, local communities or see themselves as part of the local authority family. I'll just mention the government set academies a number of objectives that they were meant to meet when they set them up, and I'm just going to mention one of those. And one of those was to support achievement in other local schools and share facilities within four years of opening. I'm not quite sure why you have to wait four years to share facilities, but that's what they said. Now the Price Waterhouse Cooper report that was done on this stated that academies with sports and IT facilities were more likely to share their facilities with local schools than other types of academies. Around about the same time, the National Audit Office survey couldn't find a single school in the maintained sector that had actually used any of the sports facilities of other academies. So it seems that the sharing that's been talked about is more virtual than actual. And it's difficult even for me to give you a clear picture of what's happening to the staff in academies. There is a lack of hard data. I know that several unions, we've all tried to, the teaching unions, my own union, TUC, we've tried to gather hard evidence on what's actually happening to staff. 
There are, there is, we're now beginning to gather a body of evidence, but it's still a bit patchy. I don't know if John's getting more up to date information. But it's not surprising <coughs> because fragmentation often leads to less union involvement and to staff being less likely to want to put their head above the parapet and be identified as union activists. Academies, as we know, can set their own paying conditions for all staff. And the irony for us is this is coming at a time when just recently the government, last September, the government announced that they were going to set up a new national council for school, staff, school support staff, which would cover, give a paying conditions framework across all of England. This will apply to all types of schools, community, foundation, voluntary aided, but not academies. And it's issues like this, together with lack of accountability, that contribute to the general air of mistrust that is around academies. What I can say is that the process of setting up academies, particularly where it involves merging or closing a number of local schools, is divisive and deeply demoralising for the staff involved. In our experience, particularly where it involves an individual sponsor, they usually have very little, regardless of the, the hype there is around the excellence of the, the private sector, in our experience, these sponsors have very little experience of industrial relations issues. And often what we do is bring in expensive consultants to deal with these things at local level. 